Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr, and I'm Chief Knowledge Broker for Octo, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar on blue carbon as a natural climate solution. Um, I'd like to welcome our presenter today, Dr. Professor Peter McCready um, with Deakin's Blue Carbon Lab, and we also have on Maria Palacios and Michelle Costa, who um, may also be answering questions as part of this webinar. Um, and I'd like to welcome all of you and let you know that this we webinar is part of the C Success project, which is implemented jointly with IUCN and is part of the UN Development Pro Program's Ocean Innovation Challenge. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let you know um, several items. First of all, that we have closed captioning available, as well as translation of the captions into quite a few languages. This option is found in the user interface at the bottom of the screen. Um, second, we also have live um, interpretation into Thai, um, which you can also access in the user interface. And um, the presentation today will be anywhere from about 30 to 45 minutes, and after we Afterwards, we will have dedicated time for question and answer. Uh, you can, however, send in questions throughout the webinar as they as they occur to you. Um, there's two ways to ask questions. One is through the question panel, um, and that that's a good way to send in questions to be answered by um, Peter or Maria or Michelle. Um, but you can also put questions and comments in the chat panel. Um, the chat, you are, you are able to chat with all of the attendees and we encourage discussion on the topic of blue carbon in the chat panel. We just ask that you keep the um, anything going into the chat panel to all attendees on the topic and professional, but we do encourage you to share resources that you know of, any additional information um, regarding questions asked or any, uh, any other useful information, you're welcome to put in the chat to share with everyone. Um, so thank you again, Peter, for being here. And thank you also to Maria and Michelle. And I will turn it over to you now for your presentation. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you all. Thank you. Thanks to all of you who have uh, dialed in. I know for some of you it's early morning or uh, late at night. So I really appreciate uh, speaking to you as blue carbon enthusiasts and those who want to learn more. Uh, we were just reflecting around how this webinar came about, and I believe that there were some community members uh, in Thailand and elsewhere in Southeast Asia that were looking for a little bit more guidance on how do you assess blue carbon sequestration in their areas and developing monitoring schemes and also staff training. And so uh, Susie Crick, who's the president of the Surf Lifesavers Foundation, uh, Surf Riders Foundation, sorry, uh, gave uh, Blue Carbon Lab a little plug uh, for some of the work that we've done recently in the Seychelles. So here we are. And uh, just want to manage expectations about what this webinar is. It's an overview of the approach taken by Blue Carbon Lab and our partners towards quantifying blue carbon opportunities and also towards implementation. And I say towards because as many of you are probably experiencing, blue carbon projects are complex and there's a lot of pre-restoration homework that needs to be done uh, before you can have your ribbon cutting ceremony and crack your champagne and commence restoration. So this webinar isn't going to tell you everything that you need to know about establishing blue carbon as a natural climate solution. It's an overview, uh, but hopefully it'll give you a little bit more confidence as you start to move through your blue carbon projects. And I am aware that there are some, um, there's some interest at the moment in an intensive masterclass that could be run towards blue carbon project development with some sort of accreditation. If that interests you, I would love to know in the chat, just say, yes, this, I'd love to do a blue carbon masterclass for blue carbon crediting, let us know. And I think that might stir some activity from um, those of us who might be in a position to support that happening. So I am here speaking to you from Australia where it is customary to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians of, of the land in which I'm on. Uh, I am on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And these are a people who had a great respect and connection to coastal wetlands. Uh, so coastal wetlands, which we often refer to as blue carbon ecosystems, they were a place for major gatherings of the 22 clans of the Kulin Nation. And uh, as is often the case with First Nations peoples around the world, coastal wetlands were seen as essential for survival. 
They are the pharmacies, the hardware stores, the supermarkets. And these ecosystems, unfortunately, weren't valued in the same way by European settlers of Australia. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Australia's history, Australia was invaded and colonized around 200 years ago by the British. And there was a practice which actually goes back to ancient Greece, and it was reinforced throughout the Middle Ages of draining coastal wetlands. And this is because they were often seen as being places of little productive value um, and also a major source of disease. And actually, it was later disproven by John Snow, uh, the physician and chemist uh, Louis Pasteur in the mid 1800s, that the diseases that were being blamed as emanating from wetlands, this was actually untrue. In any case, um, wetlands in Australia and elsewhere around the world were destroyed at scale. Uh, we've destroyed about half the world's coastal wetlands or blue carbon ecosystems. And the Australian government's method for collecting blue carbon credits is actually to reverse the process of wetland drainage that led to the loss of about 8 million hectares of blue carbon habitat in Australia. So it involves reinstating tidal flow back to the coastline by removing bun walls and dikes and, and levees. Um, I find all this historical stuff fascinating. I think it's important that we understand some of the stupid things that we've done in the past uh, or perhaps our ancestors have done and also to learn you know, how we got in this mess and so that we don't make the same mistakes again. So I'm here representing the Blue Carbon Lab and we're a research team based at Deakin University and we're working on freshwater and coastal ecosystems to under understand their role in mitigating climate change and also enhancing our blue economy. We have a very applied focus. Blue Carbon Lab's research is underpinned by a mission which is to achieve science for impact. And so there's three things we live by. We focus on real world problems. In this case, it's mitigating and adapting to climate change. Uh, we translate our science into policy, and we also bring our partners and clients along on the journey. And these are some of our current research themes. Uh, what they all have in common is that they are uh, tackling big issues facing people and our planet, and many of them are cross-cutting. So, for example, the blue carbon theme integrates with other themes such as citizen science, uh, ecosystem restoration, natural capital, biodiversity, fisheries, microplastics, and uh, coastal protection. And these are some of the faces of the Blue Carbon Lab. There are 40 in the team at the moment, including 20 PhD level scientists, massive geographical diversity in terms of where these people have come from. I think we're up to something like 15 different nationalities, uh, very diverse expertise, ecology, microbiology, economics, coastal engineering, chemistry, social science, spatial science. And this seems to be increasingly necessary to take these trans disciplinary approaches because we're tackling some very large and wicked transdisciplinary problems. Um, so I'm here speaking on behalf of the team, uh, but uh, as Sarah mentioned on the call, we also have uh, Dr. Maria Palacios and Dr. Michelle Costa, and they're gonna be watching the chat and happy to answer any questions and provide links to any of the projects I refer to. Um, so let's get underway. Well, I'm sure you all here know what blue carbon is, but just in case anybody's joined and we don't want to leave you behind. So the term blue carbon was coined, um, gosh, it must have been almost 15 years ago, and it refers to carbon that's captured and stored by coasts and oceans. Uh, the oceans are blue, so we call it blue carbon. On land, we have uh, green carbon, terrestrial carbon. Um, and these ecosystems, blue carbon ecosystems, they capture and store carbon through a natural process called biosequestration. Although the heavy lifting when it comes to blue carbon drawdown tends to be done by three coastal wetland types. You've got your seagrass meadows, your tidal marshes, and your mangrove forests. Let's hope the PowerPoint doesn't crash. I've got that spinning wheel of color giving me a hard time. Anyway, you can see those ecosystems there. I'll give that a moment. Um, and so uh, these ecosystems we know accumulate uh, blue carbon in the oceans and uh, they're, uh, they're incredibly powerful when it comes to carbon drawdown. Spinning wheel of death still going. It's more than just blue carbon they're providing. They're also providing nursery grounds for the fish that underpin our fisheries. They translate uh, uh, protein for billions of people around the planet. These are nursery grounds for juvenile fish. They also bolster biodiversity and provide critical habitat for many endangered species. They remove pollutants, they clean our water, they protect our coast against extreme weather events. And in many parts of the world, a mangrove forest can mean the difference between life and death. 
and there's that spinning wheel. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment, and uh, now's a good chance to stretch your legs while I uh, end show and try and restart PowerPoint. Oh, control alt delete. Excuse me. Um, this uh, seems to be having a catastrophic failure here. Maria, you have the presentation, right? So Maria. Okay, thank yes. you. Um, if Peter can't get it going again, do you want to share it? Yes. For anyone who just joined at the um, early on at the beginning, uh, Peter mentioned the possibility of organizing a master class on blue carbon um, with possible uh, certification uh, or uh, certificates available. Um, if this is something that has interested you, um, you can go ahead and let us know in the chat and we'll be sort of tallying up and can contact people afterwards if this is, is able to, to happen. Does anybody know the sequence to uh, force quit here? Okay, we see the presentation now. Ah, very good. Okay. okay. All right, very good. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to stop. Sh if I stop sharing screen, we switch to another screen. Yes, I I have my screen, Pete. Excellent. Okay. Now all I need to do is figure out how I can see your screen. <laughs> Um, can you minimize Zoom altogether? Don't close it, just minimize it. And uh, oh, sorry. Um, uh, I'm I'm fully frozen at my end. I can't actually do anything right now. Okay. Maria, you know these slides pretty well. You want to take us through the next couple? You're going to kill me for suggesting it. But yes. I know that you're yeah. Stuck. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I'll take I'll take over. Um, cool. So as we know, blue carbon ecosystems. We're really talking about three main um, three main guys. These are the key players. So we have the seagrass meadows, um, the mangrove forests, and the salt marsh ecosystems. Are they the ones doing all the heavy lifting and the main ones we talk around the world? And the reason why they're so famous and they're so good is basically because they have some let's call it some specific secret weapons. So the first one is that compared to any terrestrial ecosystems, they actually have a really, really fast and super speedy um, capture and burial rate. So in this graph taken from a scientific paper, we have an, a quick, easy comparison between uh, terrestrial green forests and our blue carbon friends. And what you can see is that any of our uh, blue carbon ecosystems, coastal wetlands, can bury and trap carbon 40, 50, heaps of more times faster than any of the other um, terrestrial counterparts. So they really are really good just grabbing all that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and locking it into the soil. The second reason why, they're, why they are called our uh, climate change champions is because they not only capture it, but they can actually store it for long-term periods of time. So we're talking centuries and millennia. Once um, all the carbon gets trapped into the floor, it really can stay there for a lot, or a lot of time. And this is usually the case because um, as you, many of you have walked and been in coastal wetlands, all uh, the mud is really has really low levels of oxygen, uh, very high salinities. So it has a perfect environment that really reduces and slows down the composition of carbon. Um, so how it works. This video that we're showing here at the moment um, has the carbon emissions, uh, how usually they get generated in in, in like a timely timely and uh, manner. So here we have a video in New York and it's generating all those bubbles. And these bubbles, each one is equivalent to one ton of carbon dioxide. And you can see how the problem really 
starts getting out of control. It's not just like one bubble uh, that gets generated. We have a lot of people and we've been generating carbon emissions for a long, long period of time. So then you can see how the problem really starts getting out of control. And the problem is not just uh, stopping the carbon emissions. That is for sure the first thing we need to stop, stop burning fossil fuels. But at the same time, we've generated so many of these bubbles that we need to figure out what to do with all of them. And the answer to that is basically biosequestration, just trying to find systems, natural systems that can lock them up back into the soil. So, Pete, did you, how are you doing? Pete? Um, he's off right now. I think he's probably restarting his computer. Uh, so, okay, uh, okay, yeah, sorry, so <laughs> just, well. just checking. Um, yes, so the, basically the, the, the solution is to try to use biosequestration to lock all that carbon back into the soil. And as I mentioned, these ecosystems are really, really efficient and an efficient way to do that. The problem um, with these ecosystems is that they have great capacity to store carbon, but we need to watch out because with that comes a big responsibility. It could be very easy that if we destroy them whenever um, we've had changes in land use or where there's extreme levels of pollution or contaminants that arrive to the ecosystem, then we could easily re release what it's called blue carbon, what we like to call blue carbon bombs. Basically, all the ancient carbon that has been stored there for centuries and millennia can release back into the atmosphere, making um carbon emissions and climate change, even a more serious problem. Here, for example, you can see an example of um, what, how much how much pollution is generated for just um, creating a hundred grams of a shrimp cocktail. So basically, yeah, destroying the ecosystems and removing all these resources has a big carbon footprint. Maria, I'm back if you want me to sub back on, yes. but you are doing an amazing job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm happy to keep listening to you, but I, I uh, think that's a bit unfair. <laughs> All right. yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to jump back onto yeah. screen sharing. And this carbon bomb issue really is a big problem. Uh, as we were chatting on the phone uh, before uh, this uh, webinar started, um, Sarah had mentioned that a big problem in, in Thailand, which was one of the reasons we're doing this uh, webinar, is to do with loss of uh, seagrass meadows. And what we have seen and has been demonstrated scientifically is ancient carbon leaking out of these ecosystems um, and uh, uh, putting um, putting carbon back into the atmosphere. I hope you can see the screen now. Okay. Uh, just Sarah, is that you're seeing the right screen now? Uh, yes, perfect. Yes, you're yes, good. yes. Terrific. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the shrimp cocktail example is a fantastic one by a colleague, Boone Kaufman, where we're seeing throughout Southeast Asia a lot of conversion of mangrove forest into shrimp farms. And from a, um, a productivity perspective, we're looking at great economic value being generated, but what we're not capturing is the um, decline in these ecosystems and the flow-on effect that has for fisheries, for carbon, and so on. Um, uh, I really like this example of blue carbon project at scale. It wasn't designed as a blue carbon project, but uh, we had um, during the Vietnam War, uh, the US bombed large vast areas of mangrove forest uh, with, um, with these Agent Orange. So we're going back here to the sort of mid seventies. And there's been, the US government has come in and worked in partnership with the Vietnamese government to restore vast areas of mangrove. And so far they've restored an area of about 1.5 square kilometers. And to put that into perspective, that's an area about the size of Singapore. Um, and the carbon, it's been estimated, the carbon that's been drawn down since that restoration of that 1.5 kilometer area is about three times the annual emissions of Vietnam. So hopefully the scene is now set. We're on the same page about the problems and opportunities. Let's look into some of the approaches to establishing blue carbon as a natural climate solution. Now, where we all want to be is here. We want to be on ground action. Most of us got into this profession because we want to restore and conserve nature. And 
to get there, we have to go through these steps. It's understanding the opportunity, and I'll go th step through this. And so it's through coring campaigns, mapping and modeling blue carbon at different scales. Uh, then we've got this next step around breaking through some of the barriers to on-ground action, and then um, here's where we really want to be. Uh, blue Carbon Lab has spent a lot of time here, and we're spending a lot of time here, and we're starting to finally break through some barriers and get some on-ground action happening. Um, but as you've probably experienced, the demand for blue carbon is incredible. There are so many governments and industries seeking blue carbon projects. And this is a photo I, I use as an example here in Australia. So I never thought that there would come a time when I'm knee deep in mud and have people out at the field site with us on this boardwalk comprising the Australian government, BHP, Qantas, uh, Lion Nathan, HSBC, ANZ, you know, all these um, incredibly powerful corporate sectors wanting to hear about blue carbon. Um, and there was a, a paper recently by a colleague, uh, Dan Fries, who uh, looked, uh, did a market survey and showed that about 51% of asset managers now saw opportunities for investment in blue carbon. So these sorts of events lead to some astonishing headlines. This particular uh, day, there were some reporters on there uh, and the headlines are kind of sensational, right? We, we almost need to temper uh, expectations around the blue carbon opportunities. Um, we know it's not a silver bullet. Uh, we're, we're not seeing many blue carbon projects emerging. Um, and so we need to break through and start to deal with some of the supply to make the most of this, I guess, wonderful opportunity we have hopefully to get a, a, some more capital flowing into conservation and restoration of coastal wetlands. So I wanted to look at what is the state of blue carbon projects globally? And this is some work by one of Blue Carbon Lab's PhD students, Nipuni Pereira. Um, this work hasn't yet been published. It's under review. So just please treat it as confidential. Um, she wanted to have a look at existing blue carbon projects to get a better feel for the state of the current blue carbon market. And she did a deep dive into all the existing and planned projects to explore the trends in commercial blue carbon projects. And this image yeah. shows... Mm. Peter, can I ask you to just slow down just a little bit? Sure. For the yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, when I get excited, I tend to go pretty fast. I'll do my best to slow down. Uh, if you notice here, there the projects are spread uh, throughout the equator. Um, so a lot of projects we're seeing um, have these clusters of uh, um, what Nipuni describes as interlinked legal, political, and social spheres. So when one blue carbon project starts, others tend to follow. We also make the observation that most of the projects, the blue carbon projects globally are VERA projects, and they're sitting at varying stages from being under development uh, with perhaps a project idea note approved through to uh, registered um, at the other end. That's the, the fully registered projects. So the other observation we have here is that they tend to be mangrove projects, um, some seagrass projects, and some others are a mixture. Another observation we have is that the scale of blue carbon credit uh, issuance varies massively. So of the 11 registered projects, you have some that are delivering in the low thousands. This scale here is thousands. And then you have some in the order of millions with the uh, Delta Blue project in Pakistan being the biggest, exceeding 3 million carbon credits. They are selling like hotcakes. In most uh, projects, the issued volume is completely sold out, and that reflects the high demand for these projects. And they're seen as a good investment. There's low retirement volume. That would indicate that most of the credits are, um, most of the credits are being circulated in the market without being cancelled off by end buyers. And also, most of the projects involve public-private partnerships. And so having community buy-in is very important. A couple more observations. We see these are the categories of market actors, so those who are contributing to the development of blue carbon projects internationally and those who are buying the blue carbon credits. Blue carbon projects are mainly developed by uh, profit-based private companies and NGOs. And in the credit buyer category, transportation is actually the highest buyer of blue carbon credits and also a reseller uh, um, um, a finance market um, also comprises uh, technology and a few other areas as well, hospitality. Um, so that work will be published soon. 
So one of the first steps for any blue carbon project is to quantify the opportunity. We want to achieve scale so that our blue carbon projects can achieve meaningful carbon abatement and also co-benefits as well. And in addition to understanding the scale of opportunity, we want to know where are the best locations around the world to do blue carbon projects. So what scale are you working at? Um, blue carbon varies at many scales. You've got continental scale to coastline. Uh, sometimes projects are happening at very, very small scales as well as people particularly do demonstration projects and trial restoration. And what we also want to find out when we are quantifying the opportunity for blue carbon is what are the, uh, what are the drivers of the variability in the different, um, the, the, the different drivers at different spatial scales because they do vary. Uh, and of course, we want the ability to develop models uh, ar around the world. And it comes as no surprise that those who are from developing nations where there's a good deal of public investment in data collection over the years, they're in a much stronger position to develop blue carbon models. A colleague of mine, Pat McGonigal from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, he leads the Coastal Carbon Network. He's been asking the question, what do we need uh, to start to better work together to gather data at scale uh, in a more coordinated way. And so I'd encourage you to check out uh, his program, the Coastal Carbon Network and Contribute Data. Uh, what Pat is hoping for is that we have a one-stop shop repository of data from uh, around the world that people can access and contribute to and leads to more sharing of information. Blue carbon isn't a silver bullet, and we often find ourselves needing to manage expectations. Some years ago, some colleagues and I wanted to get a better estimate of how much mitigation potential is there if we were to conserve and restore blue carbon ecosystems around the world. And I'm talking here about just the classic blue carbon ecosystems, so seagrass meadows, tidal marshes, and mangroves. And what we found is that existing blue carbon ecosystems around the world store more than 30 billion tonnes of carbon across 185 million hectares. And if you're struggling to conceptualise what that looks like, well, uh, each one of these blue balls you're seeing here in this video, it's a video produced by Climate Visuals. Each one of those blue balls represents the equivalent of one tonne of CO2. Uh, and this is what one day's worth of emissions look like from New York City. So... If we could visualize emissions, it would probably make life a lot easier. And so what we further did was explore, if we did stop destroying these ecosystems, uh, we found that we would avoid the emissions of 304 million tons of CO2 equivalents each year. And if we restored at scale, we se could sequester uh, 841 million tons of CO2 each year. And what does that mean? Well, if you combine those two figures together, conserving and restoring blue carbon ecosystems would uh, be equivalent to 3% of global emissions. So not a silver bullet, but a very important tool we have in the fight against climate change. And these are some findings from an analysis we did that focused on Australia. And the approach we took uh, looks like this. We look at what we had in the past, what we have now in terms of blue carbon habitat, and what we could have in the future under different management scenarios. And some of you on this call might be working at the level of a nation as well. And I cannot express how value it has been in Australia to have uh, maps indicating um, where the blue carbon opportunities are at a national scale. This has been invaluable in expressing uh, opportunities to blue carbon policymakers and also for having some hard numbers on the scale of opportunity for action. So a key output of our work when we're quantifying blue carbon opportunity is a map like this one here. And so it shows areas suitable for restoration and it is a tremendous communication tool. Maps are one of the oldest nonverbal communication tools we have and it doesn't matter your background and your education. Humans are very good at interpreting maps and you might've experienced this yourself when you're, you're lost, you're overseas and you point to someone, uh, to a map and you don't speak the language, but you can get help on where you need to go. So we use these heat maps and the heat maps show how much blue carbon we have currently and separate maps are used to communicate where the restoration could happen. So those blue carbon hotspots. 
And at a more local scale, uh, this is where we're spending a lot of our time now working with local councils, getting closer to having uh, progressed on-ground action. And we're modeling different management scenarios. In this case, we have some scenarios to do with uh, planning for sea level rise, uh, fencing, reinstating tides, and we estimate the carbon abatement over different time periods and also what are some of those co-benefits that could be derived from that restoration. I'm going to break things up here with an example, and I'm going to give you an example uh, that might seem simple, but it has a, a very prickly policy dilemma for us at the moment in Australia. If you ever visit the Great Barrier Reef, there's a good chance you've flown into Cairns Airport, and this is home to the land of the Dauru people. Um, and here are some of the Yiragangi ranges from the Dauru Aboriginal Corporation. And these are a people who want to be repatriated with the land, who want to understand what opportunities there are for them as a community to do blue carbon projects. And from what we've observed from speaking to many traditional owners around Australia, their elders are seeking blue carbon projects that would provide an opportunity for their young people to do meaningful work on country. So for example, um, running blue carbon restoration projects. And perhaps some of you have a similar, uh, similar desire from traditional owners in your own country. And meanwhile, Cairns Airport, uh, they were interested in the role that the rangers have historically played. And the rangers are a bit like guardians of the forest. What role have the rangers played in maintaining the health of the forest and what that has meant for blue carbon additionality? They wanted to get a sense for the blue carbon stocks and the sequestration rates thanks to the ongoing management of the forest by the traditional owners. And this is a common story we see around Australia. And in addition, the Cairns Airport is owned by JP Morgan, and they have a $700 million sustainability loan, and they get a basis point reduction on their loan for meeting certain biodiversity objectives. So it's really fantastic to see economic incentives for businesses to become more nature positive. And so the Blue Carbon Lab were invited on country by the Dalru Aboriginal Corporation and to join them in wetlands for two-way learning and capacity building. And this was facilitated by the Cairns Airport and a big shout out to uh, Lucy Friend who made that happen. And so we, we wanted to get an estimate of uh, how much blue carbon is there, how much is being sequestered. And uh, perhaps not surprisingly, there is lots and lots of blue carbon there, but there weren't any opportunities for additionality. And so we find ourselves in a predicament because we know that blue carbon markets depends on meeting principles of additionality, which means you have to be doing something different to business as usual through conservation or restoration to, um, to gain more blue carbon. But in many parts of Australia where uh, coastal wetlands are still under management by traditional owners, uh, there isn't this opportunity for additionality. Um, and so we get this uh, concern here about carbon colonialism in that those whose ancestors have destroyed a lot of the coastal wetlands are actually in, a best in the best position to capitalize on blue carbon markets because now they can get finance for restoring what uh, has been destroyed. And so um, this is really something I think we need to think about is a potential perverse outcome from blue carbon markets or any carbon market really is there something more we can be doing to recognize First Nations peoples and the roles they've played in maintaining healthy blue carbon ecosystems historically? So let's look through this data gathering process. So we do these coring campaigns. They're pretty straightforward. Uh, we have many different ways in which we core blue carbon um, and we have instruments that are worth thousands of dollars and are very fancy, but our team tends to prefer just bashing a piece of PVC into the ground and getting out the sediment. Uh, you can always um, improvise here. I've used coconuts and anything possible to bang these tubes into the ground. And that's what a, a blue carbon core looks like. And here, this person in the lab is slicing up the blue carbon. They're going to run it through our carbon nitrogen analyzer, or possibly in this case, it's maybe using loss on ignition. And uh, they'll measure the carbon content in the core. 
And you can also do other fancy things. You can look at eDNA and stable isotopes to look at where the carbon has come from, carbon fingerprinting, we call this. And we also do age dating of the sediment. So this works out the rate at which the carbon has been sequestered over time. It can get a little bit expensive, but uh, uh, it's very important data. So then once we have the carbon data, we begin to model the blue carbon stocks over spatial areas. And I'll touch on that modeling in the next slide. Um, and then once we have our data set of blue carbon uh, distribution currently and what we had in the past, we're in a strong position to look at areas that are amenable for wetland restoration in the future. Uh, and then we look at the co-benefits. So what other values might we get if we were to stack environmental credits? So blue carbon plus perhaps a biodiversity credit or a coastal protection credit, increasing resilience in the coastline, maybe pollution removal. These blue carbon ecosystems are incredible for removing um, many different types of pollutants, including uh, plastics. And this is really giving us a holistic view of the blue carbon restoration projects. And it's probably necessary in many instances to stack environmental credits to make a blue carbon project financially viable. And then we come back to this last step, which is really about assessing the feasibility of a blue carbon project, looking at things like, are the landholders amenable to blue carbon? Um, does it stack up from a cost perspective? What sort of permits and approvals do you need? And this is a very important step. It's uh, We often call this the pre-feasibility step. Oop. The pre-feasibility step. And then here we get to a feasibility stage where we go into a full analysis to inform a potential blue carbon project. Now, I'm not a modeler. I'm not a spatial modeler, but uh, Michelle Costa on this call is our chief modeler. And so you can ping her on any technical questions. But this paper is a good one for you to look up if you want to know more about some of the technical elements of modeling blue carbon projects. And I'll just make a couple of observations. These are my layperson's perspective about modeling. So this sort of stuff requires usable imagery. You have to be able to process the data, validate your models, incorporate historical perspectives. And we're often looking for species specific resolution of blue carbon habitats at um, fine spatial scales. And then we also want to try and collect data on things like the geomorphic and climate uh, conditions of the area. And so coming back to a point I made earlier is that if you're living in a part of the world where there's really good access to spatial data, uh, it's gonna make your life a lot easier. As a bare minimum, I would say you need um, spatial layers on the blue carbon habitat distribution and types of habitats you have. Uh, we've done some work in developing nations where there was hardly any data. We were running on a shoestring budget and we've been able to come up with a, a reasonably good blue carbon estimate. Sure, a lot of uncertainty, um, but things are really improving. We're in an amazing era. We're seeing technology making our lives a lot easier. It's reducing costs. It's speeding up the rate of data collection. It's allowing us to do projects remotely. So to work in places where we might not be able to physically get to. In fact, Blue Carbon Lab did a couple of projects during the COVID pandemic. We did some work in Pakistan and in Seychelles where we could use remote sensing methods to uh, cost effectively estimate blue carbon uh, around a nation. And a common situation we find ourselves in is that we need more information. And I know that a lot of researchers would logically say this, they're looking for their next source of funding, uh, but blue carbon is still a nascent field with only a handful of blue carbon projects globally. And so it's good to map out the knowledge gaps. And one way we've been doing this is through a roadmap. So this is one we've done for the Seychelles. Uh, and actually I think it's a it's one of the reasons why we got invited to do this talk in the first place from a, a report we'd released and you can um, check it out on our website or I'm sure Michelle and Maria can put a link to it in the chat. So um, this is a, a summary diagram that talks about the major steps we would need to undertake. Uh, for example, uh, getting more data on the co-benefits, understanding the community uh, receptivity to blue carbon projects, are they supportive? and so on. And I think as a community of practice, we probably need to strike a balance 
there's a lot of merit in going through this logical sequence of getting your your due diligence, getting information, building knowledge base. But I'm also in favor of instances where you just say, ah, what the heck, let's just go for it and get an on-ground project. Uh, we may fail, but we'll learn a lot in the process. So getting that balance right. And great to have people involved in the data collection progress, uh, uh, process, getting the local community involved. This is a uh, some video from a program that was uh, sponsored by HSBC, where we took out their senior executives out into wetlands with us. So these were executives who uh, were investing up to $1 trillion in sustainable finance. And we talked about concepts like natural capital and ecosystem services and environmental markets. And it was wonderful not only to see enhanced climate literacy, but also behavioral change that starts to emerge within the organization. So citizen science, uh, I can't um, express how valuable it is uh, if you're working with corporate partners or government partners. Uh, I'd love to give a plug to some of Blue Carbon Lab's additional on ground work and that of our partners. Won't have time to delve into all of these, but just to give you a flavor for some of the blue carbon things that are happening, uh, you've got using uh, kelp with uh, high asparagopsis content, uh, sorry, as sorry, asparagopsis with high bromoform content um, and being used to feed cattle to reduce methane emissions. We've also got some projects around urchin culling to remove sources of uh, kelp decline. Uh, we've got another project on um, 3D printing biodegradable structures to assist restoration in the coastal zone. We're playing around with beneficial use of dredge spoil. Uh, we've got one on converting plant material that's um, discarded and raked off beaches, converting it into biochar. We've got another project on excluding non-native animals from the coastal zone to minimize trampling on blue carbon ecosystems. And then also in the teal carbon space, you probably find that a lot of the skills in blue carbon are transferable to freshwater wetlands or what we call teal carbon ecosystems. So we've got some projects here on uh, reducing emissions from farm dams, environmental watering, and also developing some low cost tech across all of these programs to measure greenhouse gas fluxes. Some final thoughts on getting blue carbon projects off the ground and doing them in a way that's fair and uh, marketable. So uh, one, I would say that you want them to be scalable. There doesn't seem to be much point doing um, really small projects unless they're gonna be for demonstration purposes. Uh, we're really looking for scale. We wanna do blue carbon projects that are significant, consequential, genuine, and really gonna make a difference in the fight against climate change. Uh, another one here is that I think um, scalable also means cost effective or even better profitable. Uh, we have as a society relied on government and philanthropic investment for a very long time to pay for conservation and restoration. And I think the more attractive nature-based solutions are to private sector, that's where we start to attract more finance consistently and, and larger finance for conservation and restoration around the world. And of course, we want to make sure that the projects are environmentally sound. There, It doesn't happen very often that a blue carbon project would have uh, negative impacts, but there are occasions where uh, we do see some risk as well in a blue carbon project um, in terms of impacts on other ecosystems. Uh, and of course, we want to ensure that um, the benefits of blue carbon projects are shared. So we want equitable sharing of benefits. And if you want to read more about some of these general principles, um, so they're both barriers and potential solutions to operationalizing marketable blue carbon, uh, here is a paper that some colleagues and I have written. Uh, these are authors include scientists, policymakers, and resource practitioners. So I want to thank you very much for listening. And I, I really am sorry about the technical glitch I had midway. Thank you dearly to Maria Palacios for uh rescuing me there, uh, given quite a few webinars and I haven't had that happen um, that I can remember. And I just want to uh, make the point too that um, I'm speaking on behalf of a, a broader team. I'm representing the Blue Carbon Lab and also our partners. And while I'm giving this talk, many of those people are actually in the field and in the lab doing the real work. So really speaking on their behalf. So credit to uh, the great work that they're doing. So uh, I think we can 
end the slideshow there and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have and also Maria and Michelle are here as well to help out. Okay, thank you so much, Peter. Um, and while there were some technical glitches, I don't think that, that stopped us for too long. Um, thank you, Maria, for stepping in and, and continuing the presentation. And thank you to everyone for your very active engagement. Um, we have some questions that we'll start with, but um, if you have additional questions, um, please put them in the question and answer box. Um, you could also put them in the chat, but they're a little easier to moderate in, in the question and answer box. Um, so there was a question early on, um, how can blue carbon quantifications and methodologies be improved and applied to avoid integrity issues that terrestrial carbon market projects face? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think, Stephen, you're probably just as qualified to answer this question as I am. But um, I think the push towards open um, open sharing of information and what's underpinning baselines, for example, and expected trajectories of a blue carbon project and uh, coming back to Pat McGonigal's um, coastal carbon network, I think is a really good way in which we can see more transparency uh, I think another thing that will help too will be uh, blockchain-based platforms too to avoid things like uh, double counting. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's certainly it's certainly an issue, I think, that we've seen within the terrestrial carbon uh, sector. And I, I think it's interesting to see innovations too in how, how blue carbon methodologies are happening. Uh, for example, the Australian government's blue carbon method it actually doesn't require any direct measurement. It's based on uh, models that conservatively estimate blue carbon abatement. So what that means is that if you're doing a blue carbon project in Australia, we are getting more money into the on-ground action because we don't require, say, a landholder to go out and take samples and send them off to an accredited lab. And we're starting to see you know, money get chewed up by what's required for integrity purposes. Instead, we're using model-based methods of um, awarding blue carbon credits. Thank you, Peter. Um, and I don't know if this will be a completely different answer, but I did want to follow up with another question of Stevens. Um, following your comments on perverse outcomes of market projects, do you have any thoughts on what a climate justice blue carbon office set could look like? What would be measured? Well, I think it probably builds on your previous point about transparency. We know that there's a lot of blue carbon or any carbon projects that are happening because companies are looking for social license to operate. And, you know, the Guardian and others have certainly lifted the lid on some poor behavior within the sector. And I don't think it's as rampant as everybody thinks. You know, I think that uh, there are some really good blue carbon projects that are happening around the world. And I think, uh, you know, can we get greater transparency on the benefit sharing is a really interesting uh, thing we should be looking at. And there's whole task force forces that have been established around the world because we know we're going to see more and more carbon projects happening. What can we do to have greater transparency? Um, and I would probably really defer to those task force and working groups and documents that are being produced. I can't remember them all, but there's lots of them coming out that are saying, this is how we should equitably share benefits. I think it's problematic or not problematic, but it's it's going to be difficult for blue carbon projects because certainly a lot of the projects that I've witnessed, they're, they're often not cost effective, um, uh, at least the ones in Australia so far. And so there's not a lot of benefit to share. In fact, it might be who's who's shouldering the, uh, the, the cost of this project blowout. Um, I mean, one project we're looking to do, it's going to, it's going to cost more to restore than what we will ever achieve in the blue carbon credit. So, yeah, look, a bit of a rambling answer to that there. But I think the point you make is very good, is how can we be thinking more about benefit sharing and transparency in how benefits are shared um, among stakeholders? Okay. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'd also add we had a recent webinar on seagrass restoration um, which argued for a much more encompassing uh, definition of, of benefits. 
um, including benefits to local communities. Um, and I'll, I'll post a link to that in the chat, in just a few minutes. Um, Peter, another question that came up, um, do you know of any blue carbon projects that have become profitable even without carbon financing? For example, by selling products from mangrove forests. Oh, when has it ever? So, so I think the question is, if I understand it correctly, when has anybody restored a blue carbon ecosystem and it's been paid? It's the costs have been covered for reasons other than carbon. Yes. Well, that's a really interesting question because we we've been doing a lot of environmental economic accounting in Australia. In fact, uh, we've had a major program with the Australian government to look at a couple of restoration case studies. Uh, there's one around Cairns, that, that case study I gave, um, and there's another one in New South Wales. And what we were trying to do was add up the benefits of restoration. And what we found was that the benefits of restoration in economic terms, dollar terms, far outweighed the cost of restoration. But here's the problem. Um, a lot of the benefits consist of market and non-market benefits. Now, the market benefits, things like, do you have a market for biodiversity? Do you have a market for carbon? Um, often we don't have uh, mature markets for these things in many countries. So the answer is no, the, the, the costs of the restoration are not outweighed by what market mechanisms there are for environmental credits. But if you add up the value, well, almost hands down in every case study we've ever done, the values of restoration in terms of benefits to society that can be translated in economic terms far outweigh the cost of the restoration. And I think what our challenge is, how do we take a lot of non-market benefits and make them market benefits? And so in Australia, for example, we have an emerging nature repair market, which is really built off things like TNFD, Task Force for Nature Related Disclosures, where we know that companies are starting to take more accountability for their impacts on nature, biodiversity, and that there should be a market that will increasingly emerge around environmental credits for wetland restoration that lead to biodiversity outcomes, or it might be improving local fisheries or coastal protection and avoided destruction of coastlines due to uh, mangroves attenuating storm surge. Thank you, Peter. Um, another question that came up, um... Was the 3% mentioned earlier for potential uh, with conservation and restoration specific to wetlands only or all blue carbon, seagrass, mangroves, kelp forests, et cetera? That estimate is only for these classic blue carbon ecosystems, seagrass meadows, tidal marshes, mangrove forests. So if we start to add up these other emerging blue carbon ecosystems, uh, seaweeds, for example, um, and the many other different types of amazing blue carbon options that are coming up, the percentage should get higher. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, are there any programs in which indigenous stewards are compensated for preventing legacy emissions that the rest of the world would have to remove? I'm not aware, but that would be a great one if anybody is involved that could plop something in the chat. I think what we're talking about here are things like stewardship credits, where we recognize uh, communities that have historically preserved nature and we all benefit from that nature, uh, whether it's just aesthetically or uh, from carbon or fish or whatever, that how can we reward historical good behavior as opposed to this situation with carbon colonialism where we see market actors often benefiting fin financially from their historical bad behavior. Okay, and actually, I think you addressed uh, the next question I was going to ask. Um, somebody had asked for um, sort of an expansion on carbon colonialism, but I think you gave um, uh, some more. I would ask Maria and Michelle, could you pop the link into the, I think it was the Four Corners episode on carbon colonialism? That would be a really good resource if you want to get into what are the problems at the moment with projects that are particularly happening in developing nations in the forestry sector around carbon colonialism. Um, let's see, is there a case for active restoration of coastal wetlands after climate extremes 
being treated as an additional human activity that generates carbon storage. Did that question resonate? Okay. Um, so I, I, if I'm not sure if I understood the correct the yes. question, but um, you know we're seeing a lot of loss of blue carbon ecosystems um, that are, are climate related, and probably maybe one of the most pressing challenges is planning for sea level rise. So we know that around the world. Uh, blue carbon ecosystems historically have been able to respond to, um, you know, changes in sea level. Uh, they are adaptive um, to a certain extent. I mean, it depends on the, uh, the the topography of the shoreline and elevation. But I think that that's something that's going to require us to think about our kids and our grandkids and beyond because, you know, sea level rise is happening and, you uh, do we have the accommodation space required under future climate change scenarios to allow blue carbon ecosystems to increasingly move into uh, lands that might be managed by groups that are not the current custodians? And again, another example from Australia, because that's where, where I'm from, but we have a lot of the Australian coastline is managed by the Commonwealth and so the government. Um, but then with sea level rise, we can project that these coastal wetlands have the opportunity to move into private and indigenous managed land. So how do we plan for that to happen as opposed to having these systems drown? Thank you, Peter. Um, let's see, the question, um, the question was, what are some of the recommended spatial modeling software or online programs available for blue carbon project developers and land managers? This is a great opportunity, Michelle, for you to step in and answer that question. So Michelle Costa is our chief spatial modeler and she will be able to give the best answer. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. <laughs> but if I understand the question correctly, you're basically looking at, it, it all depends on what type of, yeah, blue carbon quantification you are looking at. So if you're looking at uh, specific methods, like for projects that are going to be, you know, registered under the voluntary market, uh, I believe you need to follow the recommendations um, available for, you know, each of that method. So for example, here in Australia, we have the EQ scheme where we have the blue carbon method um, that allowed yeah, carbon credits to be used, uh, issued. Uh, if um, if you want to restore these ecosystems by reinstating the tide. So in that case, we have the proper kind of like model calculator that is used in that case. Uh, but if you, in other hand, if you, if you, you're just like doing some feasibility assessments or like more like a research program and you want to look at, you know, either blue carbon stocks at different scales. So, for example, if you're looking at large scale, either as a country, as Pete showed in some of the slides or more like um, in the states or councils or even like property level, there are few different types um, of techniques that you can use. It can vary, vary for like very simple mathematical calculations to more very like sophisticated uh, modeling um, algorithms that can help you understand, you know, using some knowledge of uh, blue carbon field data and uh, non variables that kind of like influence blue carbon distribution. And that can help you understand and predict how much carbon you can actually have um, at different spatial scales. Um, I responded a very similar question uh, in the chat box as well. So if you do want uh, more information on similar projects that uh, use a different methods, uh, feel free to send me an email and then I'm, helped, um, I'm happy to direct you to you know, different resources. Oh, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, and one final question before we need to wrap up. Um, there's a question, in some discussions, there has been mention of a gap between funding from the private sector to invest in on the ground blue carbon projects and the availability of suitable projects to receive this funding. What are your thoughts on creating more opportunities for the, the available financial resources to fund restoration efforts on the ground? Yeah, great question. Uh... We are seeing that a lot of the private sector wants to be more comfortable with the risk return ratio of a blue carbon project. And we don't have many examples to point to to be clear on what that 
might look like. I mean, after all, we're talking about a sector that is a for-profit sector largely. So if you're responsible for shareholders and investors, you need to know that it's going to make some money, right? Um, otherwise, if you're just funding it for philanthropic purposes, well, go for it. But that's not where we're going to see an opening up of blue carbon projects at scale. So we see a lot of the projects that um, we're involved in uh, have been funded philanthropically or by government. And I think governments have a very important role to play. If governments are saying we're open for business for blue carbon projects, and we are going to do a lot of the due diligence on a project to de-risk the project for you, I think that's going to be a way in which we start to get private sector uh, more involved in investment-ready projects, because it does cost a lot. By the time you're doing all the mapping and modeling and feasibility assessments, most people don't want a private sector. They don't want to wait for those answers. They want something that's uh, served on a platter, you know, ready for investment. Hi. Thank you, Peter. And thank you so much, Michelle and Maria, um, for helping to organize this webinar. This was fantastic. Uh, we're very grateful for, that you were willing to present to us and share all this amazing work. Um, there's lots of wrap up to do for this webinar. So I'll be emailing people over the next few days um, with some of the outputs from the webinar. Um, there seemed to be tremendous interest in a blue carbon um, masterclass. And so uh, I'd love to talk more about this with you. Um, and um, I think there's, there's a very ready audience for that. Um, and thank you to everyone who came and participated and shared your knowledge and your interests and your uh, about projects. Um, so thank you again um, to all the folks at Deakin University um, for sharing their research. And um, I think many of you are signed up for Octo webinars. We'll be following up with future um, blue carbon webinars um, too. And um, we have some mangrove related webinars coming up in the next couple of months um all as part art of the c success project which um octo is working on with iucn which is part of uh, the UN development programs um ocean innovation challenge so um thank you again and we look forward to having you on future webinars and we hope we can follow up with more blue carbon resources uh to get more work on the ground right thank you everyone thank you Thank you. Bye, everyone.